This is a show that helps you grow your business by figuring out the customer experience one piece at a time. This is Growth Decoded. Hello, and welcome back to Growth Decoded, a show that investigates how the customer experience impacts business growth. I'm your host, Ernie Santarelli. If you're new here, which is likely the case because this is our second episode and we're all new here, here's the deal. Each episode, we focus on a different aspect of the customer experience, what it is, why it matters, how to think about it, and ultimately, how you can understand and use it to improve the customer experience and grow your business. In our first episode, we introduced you to our friend, the plant. No, no, wait, not, not, not that plant. Uh, this plant over here. Yes, perfect. This plant. We're growing this plant throughout the course of the show so that as your business grows, so too will this little plant. And if you were here for episode one and you thought to yourself, Ernie is definitely going to kill that plant. Believe me, I was thinking the same thing. But our little plant is making strides, and so are we. You can see here the progress that our little plant has made since the first episode. Also, our little plant needs a name. So if you've got some gluten-free, sustainable plant-based names, please drop them in the chat, and we will take them all into consideration. Now, today we're exploring the topic of Customer Experience Automation, or CXA. Customer Experience Automation is a new category of software that ActiveCampaign created in May of 2019 to help businesses solve an old problem. Now, the problem is, how do you connect to your customers when there are more customers than hours in the day? The solution is new, because no solution on the market, whether marketing automation, email marketing, CRM, or support tools, could solve for this. CXA is different because it connects across the full customer lifecycle. It ties together all of your channels, and it's an automation-first strategy. But the thing is, when you're starting out as a new business, you're able to give your customers and your contacts one-on-one -on -one attention. You're able to cultivate relationships with them through tailored experiences. You might even have the time to write out individual emails to them. You're able to provide an incredible customer experience. But as your business grows, so too does the amount of time that it takes to maintain all of these relationships. So what happens? Well, a few things, usually. First, you're getting more customers. Nice. Good stuff, honestly. That's, that's the goal, right? But more customers means more relationships, more variation in the customer journey, more differences in customer needs, support questions, buying situations, internal processes, and overall communication, more customer experiences that you have to manage, account for, and deliver. But no more time in the day. Just because your business requires more time from you doesn't mean that you get more time every day to work on it. Those 24 hours are fixed. You've got a dilemma. You've got a choice to make. And the way I see it, you've got two options. One, figure out how to get more done with less time. Or two, risk letting the quality of your customer experience deteriorate. Let's take a look at that second option first. Providing a positive customer experience is the reason why you're in this pickle in the first place. When people love doing business with you, they continue to do business with you. They also tell people about you, which is a pretty big help. So you definitely don't want to let the customer experience suffer because it's the fuel that powers your business engine. But the opposite is also true. Negative customer experiences lead to unhappy customers who will definitely stop doing business with you. A study by Zendesk found that 82% of consumers have stopped doing business with a company because of a single negative experience. An Accenture study found that across industries, 52% of consumers switch brands in a given year due to poor customer service. So that's not great. These unhappy former customers then tell basically everyone they know about their bad experience. An American Express study in 2017 found that consumers tell an average of 15 people about poor customer experiences with a business. So providing poor customer experience is essentially like the opposite of having a sales and marketing team working for you. And worse than that, these recommendations from peers are trusted and valued at a level that vastly exceeds any marketing or sales efforts that you were putting out there anyway. A study by Bright Review found that 93% of consumers won't make a purchase until they read a review. 91% of customers from the ages of 18 to 34 trust online reviews just as much as personal recommendations. Search Engine Watch found that 92% of customers trust peer recommendations. And not only that, but Power of Reviews found that 82% of customers actively seek out the negative reviews. So creating negative experiences for your prospects or potential customers is basically like training a, high, a team of highly effective mercenaries 
whose sole purpose is to steer anyone and everyone away from ever doing business with you. I think it's safe to say that option two is not the best option. But how are you supposed to get more done in less time? Well, that's where the automation part of customer experience automation comes in. You've heard about automation, right? It's the, it's the thing that runs in the background while you sit on the couch and watch friends. But how does it work? How do you decide what to automate? How can you be sure it's the right thing? How do you know how to set it up? Where do you start? Isn't the customer experience supposed to be personal? Isn't automation the opposite of personalized communication? It's just the same thing over and over and over again, right? How are you supposed to use automation to improve the customer experience? How can you automate something that needs to be unique, something that needs to be different from individual to individual, something, something so complicated as the customer experience? It's impossible. It has to be, doesn't it? Oh, oh, Shiv. Shiv, thank heavens you're here. Hey. Shiv, maybe you can help me out with this. Shiv is a member of the uh, Active Campaign Education team. He hosts a weekly show on CXA. He's had thousands of conversations with businesses about CXA. Shiv, how do we start to think about automation in a way that we can use it to, to automate and improve the customer experience? Genuinely a great question, Ernie. This is a genuinely great question. The customer experience, it's personal, it's complicated, and the path of any two given people is rarely gonna be the same. Kind of like ordering on the 77 page menu at the Cheesecake Factory. I mean, who's ordering baked Brussels sprouts with a side of white chocolate raspberry truffle? Besides, the fact is, every one of your customers will go on a different journey to becoming your customer. Some journeys are gonna be short. You know, they might see an ad, like it, go to your website and buy from you. Maybe they heard a recommendation from another customer and signed up immediately. It's all they needed. But some are gonna be more complicated. Maybe a prospect comes across your blog you wrote and they like it enough to sign up for your email list. You know, they hang out there for a few months opening the occasional newsletter without doing much of anything, but then one day, lightning strikes. Your email hits them in the right spot. You know, they schedule a call, they run through your sales process, they negotiate contracts, they buy your product, buy 10 more, you go viral, you become a billionaire, you save the rainforests, you climb Mount Everest, and then you grow a plant to represent the growth that Growth Dakota gave you, and now you're here. At the end of the day, whether the journey is short or long, whether it takes two steps or 20, or that they convert in five minutes or five months, they're both your customers. So how do you start to think about this in a way that makes it possible to automate journeys? How do you begin to map the customer journey? Again, genuinely a tough question, and to answer it, I wanna talk about laundry. Specifically, how do you decide to do laundry? Let's take a look at this flowchart. This flowchart is from a book called Inconsequential Dilemmas by Knock Knock, and it's a helpful guide to deciding if you should or should not do laundry. Look at all the different pathways or journeys that you could take to get to your ultimate goal. This is how you can think about the different choices your customers make when they're trying to get to their ultimate goal. It's what we mean when we say mapping your customer journey, right? Essentially, you have a point A when the contact first learns about you, and you have a point Z when the contact becomes a customer or when they ultimately decide not to. Now there's all these points in the middle, B through Y, that'll determine their path. Kind of like a choose your own adventure book. And these bubbles, these decisions, these actions on the chart are the various touch points that a contact would take with your business on the way to becoming a customer. And these touch points, well, you can automate that. A little foreshadow for y'all. So you don't have to account for every touch point right now. Start with the basics. What are the steps that every single contact has to go through before they become a customer? Regardless of how they've heard about you, how long they've been a contact, or anything else, what are the steps they have to complete? Then you can build from there. Think about the different ways that they can get to that point or the different places they can go from that point. These are the messages and the steps that you can begin to map out and automate. So, sounds like you're on board for using data to get to your customers and, and get them to love you, but you don't know where to start. Well, let's start to use these four questions as a guide. Who is the right person for that message? What is the right message at this point of the journey? What is the right time to send this message? And what is the right medium or channel for this message to be delivered, right? Essentially, how do you send the right person, the right message, the right time, and the right medium? That, my friends, in a nutshell, is CXA. Getting to a point where you know that you're able to communicate with your audience at every point in their customer journey. And not just communicate with them, but send them exactly what they need, when they need it, in the place they're looking for it. 
Let's see how this looks in action. Throughout this episode, we're going to hear from Sven, who is the Senior Director of Digital and E-Commerce at Koya, a plant-based beverage company. Sven and Koya are headquartered in California and have done an amazing job at incorporating the principles of CXA into their marketing strategy. Ernie actually had a chance to catch up with Sven yesterday to discuss how all of this looks in practice. I am now joined by Sven, the Senior Director of Digital and E-Commerce at Koya, um, which is a plant-based beverage company based out of, is that California? Is that right, Sven? Yeah, we're based out of Los Angeles. Perfect. I guess to kick things off, I kind of just want to get like a general lay of the land um, in terms of how you and Koya approaches the customer experience, you know, throughout the customer journey. Um, so when you think about it at large, kind of like taking a very zoomed out approach, how do you how do you think about the the customer journey at large? How do you think about, you know, finding the right person, message, time, medium? It's definitely a great question and a challenging question. And for a, a business like Koya, where we are, you know, predominantly brick and mortar and traditional retail, but also we do have a growing e-commerce presence. So not only are we, we have our own D2C website, we also have Amazon.com and another huge uh, vertical for us that's been growing like 400% in the last year is Amazon Fresh, so grocery delivery. Mm. So each platform kind of requires its its own timing and its own um, you know message per customer and and for each platform it's kind of a different need for us what we try to do is an omni-channel approach and and we use different mediums like active campaign we've recently also incorporating sms technology as well but what we do is it's heavily reliant on automations uh, to be frank with you because it's that's like the best way to to send those tailored messages based on a triggered event so for instance for us like if it's someone that's shopping on d2c and they uh, abandon a cart for instance you know we have an abandoned cart uh, sequence that um, does really well for us and for the first trigger, if they abandon the cart, we'll maybe send them a nudge like, hey, you forgot something in your basket. Here's here's free shipping or 10 percent off, kind of like a minor discount just to kind of maybe nudge them. Maybe they got distracted and they just like just close the browser, but we'll nudge them with a little offer um, and send them an email. If they don't open that or if they don't convert from that email, then we'll we have a, an automation uh, journey set up to where the next message they receive will be a little more aggressive, maybe like a 20, 15 to 25 percent off discount to really incentivize them to convert. So we're tailoring the message um, each time to, to try to get the desired action that we're looking for. What we try to do is when there's someone that signs up on our newsletter, for instance, our automation will will send like, hey, thanks for joining our newsletter. But we'll actually send them to a page where we're constantly trying to extrapolate more data from, from the users. So we'll send them a survey. And then once they fill out that survey, all that data that we've collected will then go into our active uh, campaign CRM and we'll continually start to learn more and more from them. So for instance, one, one question we'll ask them is, where do you like to shop? You know, like what grocery store are you buying Koyas from? And then if they say, for instance, Whole Foods or Ralph, Safeway, HEB, you know, what have you, we're, we're in, I think, 15,000 stores now. So we're growing really fast. What we'll try to do is then when we have a promotion, say at Whole Foods, it's, there's a two for two for six that are going on in Whole Foods. We'll send a tailored message um, and create a campaign and we'll segment that audience from everyone who said that they shop at Whole Foods. And then we'll send um, that entire audience of Whole Foods uh, shoppers a email that says, "Hey, by the way, um, Sven, because we use a um, we use a merge tag, so it kind of gets a little more personalized." There's a two for six going on at Whole Foods. Get it while it's hot. You know, the date ends in like you know two weeks to create a little bit of urgency. Mm. So that way we can also help um, brick and mortar sales by increasing sales velocity by letting our audience know um, that there's a sale going on. So that's a kind of an offline way that we also try to um, uh, tailor messages based off of data that people have submitted and we keep learning from. Okay. Okay. So first things first, it is possible to use automation to create different custom customer experiences. Now, customer experience automation starts with the customer, and that means finding the right person. Now, this person could be anyone, but it's not just anyone. It's the right person for your business. So who are they? Who is your ideal customer? What do you know about them? What types of people make up your target audience? How do they find out about you? 
What do they want? What do they need? What problems do they have? How does your product, service, or offering solve that problem? We've got a lot of questions to answer here, and the answers to these questions are going to help you create the ideal customer experience for the ideal customer. Now, this is the foundation of your customer journey. Think back to the laundry problem. That flowchart doesn't matter if the person looking at it doesn't have a problem deciding when to do laundry, or if they don't do laundry at all, because let's be honest, if that's the case, they've got bigger problems. But if you have the wrong person, everything else could be perfect, but it won't matter. Not to mention the fact that sending the right message to the wrong person isn't a great customer experience for that person. And remember, bad customer experiences tend to get talked about a lot. So, Shiv, how do you find the, the right person? How do, you, how do you find the, oh, what's this? Shiv, how do you find the right person? You know, genuinely a great question. Genuinely, Ernie, a great, great question. Also, I have a feeling that it's laundry day for Ernie with all these examples, but he's absolutely right. To do this, we need to look at all the interactions somebody is having with your business to determine who they are and what they want. And this isn't just limited to finding new prospects. It's important to analyze this from somebody who's never heard of you before to your most loyal customers and everything in between. Sounds like a big undertaking. Well, let's figure out who we're talking to first, AKA who your target audience is. If I sell high-end cameras, I'm looking for people who are in video and production. If I'm offering career coaching, I'm searching for individuals looking to make their next career move. And if I'm offering laundry services, well, you guys already know, I'm looking for Ernie. Start by asking yourself a few questions about what your goal is for each particular contact, right? Are, are you trying to get somebody to hear about you in the first place? Whether it's at an in-person conference or a Facebook advertisement, how are you initially reaching and engaging that person? Has this person already heard about you, but now you need to understand if they you know, have the solution or if they understand the solution to your, the problem, right? Are, are you trying to nurture and educate this person on their particular needs? Have they already decided that you know, they want the solution from you, but they don't yet know that they specifically want to buy it from you specifically, right? What, what strategy will you execute to convert and close people who have already been nurtured? Or are we looking at current customers, right? What kind of interactions will show us the best strategy to support and grow our base? We need to make sure we retain people who might cancel, celebrate our audience who loves us, and hopefully get our happiest customers to shout on top of a mountaintop and, and tell more people about us. Now let's go ahead and kick it back over to Sven and Ernie to talk more about how Koya finds new target audiences and how they use data to segment on these customers. In terms of you know, finding the right person, um, how do you identify new audiences or, or how do you identify new contacts? Can you kind of take me through that process? Yeah, definitely. So we, you know, like we said earlier, it's, you know, it can get really complex really fast, um, depending on uh, your business. But for instance, what we try to do is we invest a lot of money in paid media. And so we use really targeted campaigns um, to find new audiences and try to find new prospects. So we will, for instance, if we're looking for new Whole Foods customers, there's a huge audience on Facebook of people who shop at Whole Foods. I think if the audience size is at 15 million um, and we'll send them an ad that is like find a store or uh, join our giveaway. And then what we try to do is we'll, when they sign up on our website and they submit a form, we'll tag them. And so once we tag them as, you know, Whole Foods giveaway, we know that they typically shop at Whole Foods. Um, we don't know 100% for certain because it's it's based off of interest. It's not based off of actual like, hey, this is a customer of, of Whole Foods. But if they have an interest, there's typically highly likely that they are um, actual shoppers at Whole Foods and we'll tag them. And that's really how we are able to find new audiences. And we'll also, we like to try to do fun things like giveaways. We'll put together like, um, Diane, who she's our digital marketing manager, she did an awesome, she does an awesome job of putting like fun little games together for our audiences to stay engaged. So we did like flavor madness where people chose like which flavor is the best on a bracket and then everyone voted. And then by the end of it, the, you know, the number one flavor would show. So we try to like really interact with our audience that way and do fun things. But at the same time, we're also trying to on the back end tag our audiences to the appropriate kind of um, audience to uh, organize them to make sure that we know like hey this person 
they, they really like giveaways. So we'll tag them with giveaways. This person really likes discounts because they signed up on our newsletter and there's a 10% discount. So then we'll typically send them um, D to C free offers and stuff like that. Mm. So that's what we, tr that's how we kind of try to organize them based off of that. And um, most of that is through paid media and with paid media, you're able to kind of really hyper target that audience. And the cool thing with active campaign is once they submit their email and then you create a survey, just another form essentially on your website and they, and they input their email that's connected to active campaign, all the fields that you're collecting, like how many quiz they drink per week or how many, what their hobbies are, or what their, uh, favorite grocery stores are it'll automatically data gets sent to that account within active campaign that's connected to that email and it's essentially getting that account information getting smarter and smarter with more and more data and you can actually go into that person's account and see like all the different data points that you're constantly collecting so it's really awesome to like first you hook them with a newsletter with an offer and then you send out a survey like hey do you want to win a free case of koya submit this survey and then you're continually learning more and more about them and it just mm. allows you to make better business decisions and better marketing campaign tailored marketing campaigns around that data oh um well I'm definitely feeling better about finding the right person for each point, but sending the right person the wrong message is just as bad of a customer experience as sending the right person, I'm sorry, the right message to the wrong person. Because sending the same message to everyone is like, well, it's like failing to sort your laundry and just throwing it all in at once. You know, it might work some of the time for some of the items, but eventually you're gonna end up with some pink t-shirts. And so now this begs the question, how do you send the right message to the right person? Who is the right person for the message? Now, I'm not the only one who wants to know this. We took a look into the active campaign community and found quite a few questions that were just like this. And lucky for us, I know some people who can help us out. So now our customer evangelist, Tim, is going to answer some questions from the active campaign community in a segment that we like to call our customer evangelist Tim answers some questions from the Active Campaign community. Hi, I'm Tim, customer evangelist at Active Campaign. I'm here with my colleagues Molly and Gabby, and we have questions from our community that we're going to answer. Hello, Molly. What is our first question today? Hey, Tim. Our first question is from a customer who asks How would you email a 400,000 contact email list? What's the right way to segment them so that you don't email them all at once? Gabby actually got a question about this same topic. So Gabby, what did you find? Thanks, Molly. One of our customers asks, how do you prefer to send emails only to contacts who meet specific conditions? Do you create multiple lists? Do you use segments? How do you do it? These are great questions. Whether your list is 400 or 400,000, blasting that entire list with the exact same email isn't very effective. Without segmentation, you're sending the same emails to everyone. Some people click and some wonder why you're even emailing them in the first place. Because if the email is too specific, you're gambling on who it might resonate with. But if it's too broad, why will people even care? You run the risk of annoying the very people you want to be connecting with, your customers. With segmentation, you send the right message to the right person. They engage with your messages because they're interested and your marketing feels more personal to them. So what is segmentation? Segmentation is the act of grouping your contacts into segments. A segment is a group of contacts organized by information about the contact. For example, pages they visit, information from integrations, links clicked, or emails they open. Each segment contains contacts that share similar characteristics or behaviors. The purpose of segmentation is to send people relevant messages that genuinely interest them based on the data you've collected. When contacts receive messages that are relevant to them, they're more likely to pay attention to your campaigns. Behavior-based segmentation is key because when you segment by behavior, you're not only listening to what your customers are telling you, you're monitoring what they actually do. This makes it possible for you to send them the right information at the right time for as long as they're your customer. Let's look at an example. A boutique store carries clothing, stationery, and home decor. 
They have a brick and mortar location, and they also sell products online. We can segment by location or geography. Are they local? Are they visiting the store? Or do they primarily shop online? We can segment by customer behaviors, like which product pages they're visiting on the store website. Demographics data can help target the right audience. Maybe younger customers are more interested in apparel, while older customers are interested in home decor. We can also segment by what products customers are actually buying. This data can be pulled in via an integration with your online store. Finally, we can segment contacts into customers and prospects. You'll market differently to a returning customer than you would a first-time shopper. These various segments of contacts will each respond to different messaging. Some may want content about home decor. Local contacts may be interested in an in-person event at the brick and mortar location. And everyone loves a coupon, but you may want to run a promotion on a particular product rather than for the whole store. With the right messaging to the right group of people at the right time, you can reach your target audience when they are most likely to listen. All right. Those were the questions from our community that we were going to answer, and we did. Molly, Gabby, thank you both for joining me today. Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much, Tim, and thank you for helping our customers get the answers they're looking for. And thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time when we have more questions from our community that we're going to answer. Yes. Very helpful. Thank you, Tim, Molly, and Gabby for answering those questions. Speaking of questions, if you're watching this, you're following along um, live, feel free to send your questions in. Um, we will do our best to get those up here to Shiv and I and uh, get you some answers to those as well. Uh, so going back to what Tim was just saying, it's, it's all about using the data that you have or starting to gather up that data so that you can use it to determine the right message for each point in the journey. Now, with so many different possibilities, how do you start to figure this out? Tim mentioned a few things there. The emails that your contacts open, the pages that they view on your website, the links they click, and the information that you get from integrations with other tools that you're using. Now, from, this, from these four areas, you get a whole pile of information. But you've got to know what you're looking at, and you've got to know what you're looking for. These pieces of information are going to tell you a lot about who your contact is and where they're at in the journey, and once you know who they are, you know if they're the right person. And then you'll know what the right message is to send them. From there, you can create automations that repeatedly send the right message to the right person. But how do you know which message to send? Which is the right message? Shiv, how do you start to navigate this pile of laundry? I mean, uh, information. Just, you know, before we continue, I just need to ask you something really quick. Were you wearing the same thing yesterday as what you're right now with the interview with Sven? Do you have a laundry problem, my friend? <laughs> Anyways, like you mentioned, using the emails people are opening, the links they're clicking on, and the pages that they're visiting on your website, we can pinpoint not only to where they are in the journey, but also what message to subsequently send them. You know, everything CXA believes in, it revolves around actionable data actionable data. I mean, if Danny's visiting our, our blog article on how the best, you know, the best dog food for golden retrievers, then we can assume that he either has a golden retriever, is interested in finding the best dog food, or a little bit of both, right? And our message should adjust to these newly discovered preferences. The way I like to tackle this is by charting out all the potential interactions that you could have with your customers, right? Chart out the web pages they could visit, the events they could attend, the webinars they register for, the emails they open, all of it. From there, keep a tab of what you learn about a customer when they have that interaction, and this will help you pick between you know, having your call to action and your messages to be buy your product versus watch your videos for two separate customers that both haven't purchased, but their interactions are telling you that they're in different places of your customer experience. Now, I can hear all of you saying, but Shiv, how am I going to do this across all of my contacts? That's where the automation part of CXA comes into play. It's imperative to use automation not only to send your messages, but also to ensure that the data behind and within every single message is accurate and updated. CXA for operational purposes like data management is one of the most powerful ways to leverage CXA. A lot of people think that automation is the opposite of personalization, when instead, automation truly is the engine of personalization. 
Let's turn it back over to Ernie and Sven to hear a little bit more about how those two work together to send the right message. Once you have the, the right person or right you know, segments of, of your audience, as you get more information about them, learn more about each contact, how do you kind of evolve the messaging you know, with that journey? How do you approach that? From the data that we keep collecting, we're able to kind of use advanced search and then we're able to really see like who everyone that loves to skateboard, you know, and we'll create a campaign based on that. And then the content within that email is really high. Maybe we'll put a, an image of a skateboarder who is skating and also is drinking Koya, which again, from that campaign from Crush It With Koya, oh, I think that we're gonna get to, that's what we did was we were able to get a bunch of content from a, a bunch of awesome, uniquely awesome people. So uh, we'll segment on everyone who likes to skateboard. And then that mess campaign that we send out, the email campaign, the image will be of a skateboarder holding Koya, what have you. And then that's what the content will be more tailored to. And you'll find a lot better open rates based mm. off of using content within your email that's more um, hyper-targeted and related to what their favorite hobbies are, which would be skateboarding. Right. And so in this process of, you know, gathering this information is automated um, and then you're pulling the information out and then you're sending a message and, and really relying on automation to to deliver this very personalized, tailored experience. I just think there, there's a lot of, uh, of misconception about, you know, automation meaning, you know, the same thing for everybody. But um, I think you're, you're yeah. giving us a little bit here that that doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, big time. And if you didn't have automation, like you'd have to have a team of 100 people that is like going in and trying to, you know, organize your entire audience. But with, you can have a super lean team that, you know, marketing team, if you, if you implement um, automation in place of that, and it just makes your, uh, your email marketing just that much more powerful when you're able to organize everything. And the best way to do that is with, with automation for sure. Okay, so you've got the right person, the right message, and now it's time to deliver that message at exactly the moment when your contact wants to see it. But when is that? If you send the right message to the right person at the wrong time, well, what happens then? That could be no big deal, right? They just see the message and they go, huh? And then they ignore it. Or you might rub them the wrong way. Now, if the contact just purchased a product and you send them an email with a deal for that product, well, they're not gonna be very happy with you, especially if they didn't get the deal when they bought the thing. Your timing was all wrong. And timing is everything. It could be the difference between catching someone at precisely the right time, the right moment, the, the moment they're most likely to convert or take an action, or sending it a day late and getting nothing. You've got your pile of laundry, I mean data, your pile of data. And you can certainly use that information to learn more, but how are you supposed to know what the right time is? The right time is just the days between emails, right? You don't want to send too many, but you also don't want your contacts to forget about you by not sending enough. Is this what we mean by the right time? Or is it the time of day? Tuesday mornings are good, right? Unless you've got an audience that's all over the world. What's the right time for everyone? Or maybe it's just, maybe it's just when they want the email? How do you figure that out? Shiv, if we're thinking about the right time to send an email, maybe you can help me out here. Yeah. When, when's the right time? Yeah. It's, a, it's a solid question. And, and honestly, I think it, it ties back to a question we actually got from one of our, our people on chat here. Oh, perfect. Uh, where they're asking, what if you only have one product? I, I think the principles of CXA equally apply. Right? The, the principles of CXA, right message, right time, right person, right medium, they're still going to apply even if you have one singular product. And the timing of when somebody wants that product, the timing of when they're looking at that product versus somebody's maybe more in that stage of you know, consideration, when they're sure. still trying to prospectively think, do they even want the product in the first place? It's still important to listen to those cues. Yeah, absolutely. Their behavior is going to dictate where they are in the, in the decision to make that purchase more than you know, what they're going to purchase, yes. but you know, if and and when and how interested they are at that exact moment in time. Exactly, exactly. And, and genuinely, here's the harsh reality. If you're wondering if you're sending too little or, or too many messages, your heart's in the right place, but your mind is not. Remember, CXA is the art of using information to create a unique experience for each person, and that includes timing. 
customers that are clearly interested in that high-end camera because they continue to look at your pricing page, they might appreciate more frequent messaging about how great your products are. This is compared to the person that just sent in a support ticket about how their camera broke. You know, it's, it's all action-based, like we're saying. So for example, if I have a coupon code with a 24-hour expiry, I don't want to send it arbitrarily to everyone who hasn't purchased yet. I want to make sure it specifically gets sent to my leads that are clearly nurtured and understand the value of the coupon. In fact, even if we know the frequency, we can still get more granular from there. Use the information at your finger steps to understand what days of the week the majority of your contacts engage with you, what specific time each contact is most likely to open your messages with tools like predictive sending. For example, I could send you an email you know, that you're all viewing at home right now, and you'll all get it around the same time, but you certainly won't open it at the same time. Some of you might open first thing in the morning, some at lunch, some at night, some every time you feel the vibration, not to mention that we have an audience tuning in across all across the world. You know, instead, I could send an email to everybody watching this show right now, and everybody will get at a time that you specifically are most likely to open. Now, let's toss the conversation back over to Ernie and Sven around building the right timing for your messages. In terms of how you approach, you know, when is the right time to, to deliver some of these messages? Uh, could you take me through your, your thought process or kind of how uh, Koya approaches that? Yeah, for sure. I guess uh, it's kind of two steps to that. One's just regular campaigns that you send out. One's just automation sends. So I'll go to campaign level first. What we like to do is look at our reports and we'll look at historical timing that works best. Like, so what time of the week, what actual time of the day that we actually get better open rates and click-through rates. And we mm -hmm. can do that through, uh, we can find that that uh, data through our reporting tab. And then once we find a, you know, figure out, oh, Thursdays at 5 p.m. typically work better for just general sends. And then for stuff that's like D2C sales, typically work better in the morning. Um, so depending on what we're kind of sending out, what kind of campaign we're sending out, um, we'll, we'll uh, dictate what time we're gonna send it and what day we're gonna send it. So that's for regular campaign sends. And then for automations, what we like to do is if someone signs up for Koi Crew, um, they get a confirmation email that says, hey, thanks for joining the Koi Crew. That's awesome of you. And uh, by the way, here's a free coupon for being awesome and signing up. And then if they don't click on that free coupon, or I'm sorry, if they don't click on, hey, you also need to sign up and join the Koi Crew Facebook group, because that's where we do a lot of the announcements for people who win giveaways and stuff like that. If they don't click that Facebook group, then what we do is we wait like two days, three days, and then we send them another email that says, hey, Ernie, we, you know, thanks for signing up again, but we really would love for you to join our fantastic group. There's a bunch of awesome people like you in there that are, you know, posting and interacting and there's a, a ton of value in this group. And we'll send them another automation that's more tailored, that's more has more urgency to it. Um, because if you don't join this group, you know, you might miss out on winning uh, giveaway prizes and, and knowing if you're a winner in one of these giveaways. So we kind of use the automation triggers and the if if and else, I think that's the trigger yep. to where if they don't open this email, then we'll send them another email that's more urgent. And then if they do, then the automation ends and they hit the goal. So got it. That, yeah, it just seems like, again, with a with a right time conversation, I, I feel like so many people just think that there is a, a set time, a set day uh, to send and there's X amount of time that you need to, to wait between emails and, and this kind of a thing. And, and to your point about campaigns, you know, that is true to an extent, but uh, I just find it really interesting with your automation point that it's almost like when is the right time to send an email? The right time is when they tell you that it's the right time. You just need to be looking for that. Is that kind of... Accurate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You obviously don't want to oversend because then you'll start seeing a big unsubscribe rate. But, sure. you know, again, you always want to just keep looking uh, at the reports tab and you'll be able to understand like, whoa, my unsubscribe percentage rates really high this week. What did I do or this month? What did I do? I sent double the amount of emails. So let's pull back on that a little bit. Um, and then and then not send so many, or it's the opposite. Like I, you know, my unsubscribe so low. What is that point to where I can, can I send more, you know? Cause if I can send more, that means I can make more sales. I can get in front of more people. So really looking at the data and looking at the reports tab is super helpful to understand, you know, what the happy medium is. Well, I'm really feeling better about this whole thing. 
We've got the right person, the right message, sent at the right time, but we're not out of the woods just yet. We've got to send the message to the right place, the right medium or channel. Now, I was thinking the other day, there are so many communication channels today. In the last 24 hours, I've used email, telephone, yeah, like an actual phone call. It was, it was incredibly wild, truly thrilling. Zoom, Slack, Google Hangouts, LinkedIn, text messages, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, and that's just yesterday. Not to mention some of the other popular channels like TikTok or Clubhouse. Now, the thing about it is I use each of these channels in a different way to connect with different people, deliver a different message. For example, I send funny photos of my cat to my sisters on Snapchat, but I'm not going to set up a Zoom call with them so that they can see him. Also, this is Frank. I wouldn't send my grandmother an Instagram DM, even though she is on Instagram. Shout out to my grandma. If I wanted to catch up with her and see how she's doing, I would call her. Now, it's the same with CXA. In customer experience automation, you want to match the message to the person and the time, but you also need to match the medium, and more importantly, match the customer's expectations. Bad customer experiences can almost always be chalked up to a mismanagement of expectations. The thing is, today's consumers expect more, so you need to meet them where they are. Different channels have different expectations. They have different unwritten rules, and your customers expect you to follow the rules of the medium, otherwise there's a disconnect and the customer experience suffers. Now, think about the feeling when you feel the vibration of a text message from your, your pocket on your smartphone. Chances are you're like me. You use SMS for personal conversations with family and friends. The tone, the conversations, the whole thing, it's all very casual. So if you're going to use SMS as a marketing channel, you've got to think about how that message is going to be received for that medium. Is the message that you're about to text better sent as an email? Should you just change the tone? Remember, all it takes is one bad experience, one mismanagement of expectations to cause a customer to change their entire opinion on your brand. Medium matters. All right, where do these shirts keep coming from? Look, your customers prefer different channels for different modes of communication, different messages. How do you make sure that you're sending the right message on the right medium? Shiv, how, how, can, you, how can you tell? Oh, yes, the right medium. The forgotten child of the four pillars of CXA, while arguably being the, one of the most important. Let's say that you're an online record store and I'm a contact in your database. You could know that I'm the right person looking at the fact that I've been checking out different record players. You might know the right message to get me to buy since I've been looking at Green Day's discography. You know the right time because I just put items in my, car my cart. But if you didn't give me a call out of the blue trying to sell me a Green Day record, well, I'm going to think you're pretty creepy. This is the opposite case if I had just come back from an open house where my partner and I really loved the home. I'm going to want my realtor to give me a call to chat further about the details, not send me a DM on Instagram. Matching where your audience wants to hear about you is just as important as the who, what, and when. In the 21st century, we've got more ways to reach out to our customers than we can count. I mean, we've got email, text messaging, online ads, social media, community pages, billboards, physical mail, carrier pigeons. There are so many channels that it now takes double the number of touch points to get a customer or prospect to take an action that it just did 10 years ago. So make sure to pick a right touch point for that pigeon that, with that buy now letter. I've seen automations where people try to create three emails over the course of 10 days to nurture their new prospect and then just give up. Maybe it wasn't that you had the wrong message. Maybe it wasn't that you had the wrong time or that you had the wrong person. If you aren't seeing success, try changing up the medium and then see if your message resonates then. So at the end of the day, every interaction with your business is just another digital opportunity to read that digital body language your customers are giving you in an ongoing con conversation that you're having with them. Your job is to meet them where they are in every way possible. And this is especially going to be highlighted in the next clip from Sven. Take it away while I finish up folding Ernie's laundry. Throughout this conversation, you've mentioned uh, email, you've mentioned SMS, you've mentioned Facebook. What is the, the right medium to contact someone on? Um, or, or do you change mediums you know, based on where they're at in the customer journey? Yeah, you know, we are open to all mediums. We, uh, our philosophy and our marketing team is test before you even come to a conclusion. I think that's a good philosophy for any digital marketer because a lot of people go, well, I don't think that's going to work. And then they just never try when actually that could have been a home run. 
Mm. Um, a good example of that was for me personally, you know, I, it, I'm sure you've heard of Instacart before. It's one of the largest grocery delivery uh, mm -hmm. platforms uh, two years ago. I didn't really know much about it. And people were telling me you should check it out. I didn't really check it out. But then my CMO who came on board was like, Hey, we should really check out Instacart. And he turned it on and it went gangbusters and we got a ton of new customers from that platform. So I would always highly suggest testing anything uh, before knocking it. And a good um, kind of example also is like TikTok. Like we were a little intimidated because it's like TikTok requires a lot of creativity and a lot of good content creators, which is really hard to find and also can be very expensive. But we found a really awesome way to kind of um, to get that content through. And, and it just took it just took time and it just took the uh, just taking that first step and, and, and we were able to figure it out. Yeah, depending on the medium, the messaging definitely changes like SMS for us has been huge, but the messaging has been so much different than email. It's much more kind of like, hey, you're my buddy, you know, on SMS. It's like, hey, what's up? You know, it's uh here's a funny gift to laugh at it's much more relaxed and um i think it's pretty cool because it's you get way better open rates for sure but it's just a different type it's just you're just layering communication with your existing audience and it's really important whether they're scrolling on our facebook feed and they're at work and they you know they see a facebook ad from us and then you know or they're searching for us on google we always want to be top of mind and then all of a sudden they get an email from us and a you know a text message from us they're, it's always intent sense like we don't sense we don't want to just spam people right um, but we always also want to be top of mind too because once they're done with work then they're at a grocery store and then they saw that ad and then they saw that uh, sms and that email and then they go oh i should grab a few coils while i'm at the store so it's so different on so many different platforms just because each medium and platform has a different kind of audience to be honest yeah, absolutely. And a different expectation that goes with each type of, of message, you know, like the, the difference between receiving an email and receiving a text message, like your expectations of what both of those things are is completely different. And so if you can match the, the expectation, the tone, you know, everything, which it sounds like, you know, it's very top of mind for you. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's how you provide that incredible customer experience. Okay, okay. Um, before we get in here to close this out, we did get another question um, on YouTube. And the question is, is CXA backed by AI? Um, now, the short answer is, it's, it's more backed by what I would call machine learning, right? Is, is that what you would say, Shiv? That's what I would say. Yes, machine learning. The, the idea that it's not like the robots are taking over and, and all that kind of stuff where crazy stuff is happening on the back end. We're simply looking at the data that's right. coming in and constantly learning from that so we can do better next time. A great example that we were just talking about was that, that idea of predictive sending. Yes. Right? The idea that every single person watching this right now could get the email at their designated time that we know that you would particularly be most likely to open that email. Right. And, and you know, machine learning is an aspect of customer experience automation, um, but it certainly is not something that is required. You know, you can build these automations by mapping your customer journey, by mapping out where these touch points are, the different messages, the different signs and behaviors that you'll be looking for in your contacts to then, you know, trigger those messages and those automations. You know, that, that can all be done just, just by you. No robots necessary, right, except to send the, the emails. But these machine learning aspects, predictive sending, um, predictive content is another feature that we, that we have available. Um, they can certainly, you know, complement the process, but by no means are they a necessary precursor to using CXA. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, so right person, right message, right time, right medium, so that each customer has the experience they need the experience best suited to their situation, their expectations. Now you can use the information in your pile, but how do you actually gather and use this information? It makes sense in theory, but what about in practice? How do you actually do it? How do you automate that process? Well, I had the same question, and that's why I enlisted the help of my good friend, Cody Lindley, the marketplace manager at Active Campaign. We sat down yesterday to figure out how you can grab this information and then use it to automate the customer experience. So here is this week's installment of Automate That. Okay, yes, now it is time for the segment of Growth Decoded where we show you how to automate that. I am joined now with the marketplace manager, Maven Magician himself, 
Cody Lindley. Cody, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ernie. How are you doing today? I am. I'm doing great. I was a little overwhelmed earlier with all of the different things that CXA could be, but we're getting to the bottom of it, and uh, I'm I'm ready for for this to help drive it all home. Um, again, this is Cody. This is me. Those are our chef hats. We forgot them somewhere, but <laughs> we're here to show you. Uh, mm, Automation recipe of the week, not quite this time. What is this more along the lines of, Cody? We're more showing you an uh, automation concept of the week that's really going to make sure that you can really set up what you need to with them. And automation Ernie, concept of the week, reveal time. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. What were you saying? No, I was just going to say, next slide, and you knew. <laughs> I, there you go. What's under the cloche? What are we looking at? We're looking at lead scoring and event tracking. Cody, uh, fill, fill me in here a little. What are, what, are, what are these things? So lead scoring and event tracking are two great things you can have set up in your platform. And they're not, they're not necessarily just a one-off recipe. They are some ideas that really help you run things on the background. You set up the logic and it's going to go the way you've set it up. Lead scoring obviously is based on certain actions. You can add or deduct points from a contact based on you know the actions they take, as I just said. And then event tracking is having a specified event you've set up with coding that once it's triggered, you track it. <laughs> so, so much of what we've talked about here uh, regarding customer experience automation is the ability to send the right person the right message at the right time in the place that they're looking for it or on the right medium. And, and these two processes are really what's gonna help you or inform that decision so that you know what the right message is, or you know when the right time is, or you know who the right person is. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited here. Let's uh, let's jump into this. We're not going to the automation store today, just the automation trigger store. And what are we uh, what are we putting in the cart? Yeah, we have to have a couple of ingredients, you know. So we wanted to point out the triggers and then also the actions that these features will touch. Mm. Obviously, in the triggers, we have event is recorded, score changes. One real quick call out I want to talk about score changes. A lot of people think about that as reaching a threshold or a high range, but you can also run things on if someone goes below a threshold or in a bottom range as well. So you can always make sure you're retargeting as well. That's mm. something we like to tell people. And then goal is achieved. Maybe you have a goal in another automation that is specifically for that automation that uses scoring or an event being tracked. And you want to know when the goal is achieved, not necessarily that thing happening that will also be one that comes into play. Awesome. So automations are, you know, if this thing happens, then we send them down a path. And so what are the things that we are, what are the paths that we can send them down? Yeah, that's a great call out. Both in if else actions and goals, we can use both event tracking and scoring, as I've mentioned. If else actions is, you know, we put up a question, a yes, no question based on conditions. They either go down the yes path or the no path. And then goals, uh, as a quick refresher, those are, uh, you know, actions that if someone meets it, let's say that they interact with your emails enough during a nurture series and you want to pull them down and send them the final offer when you think they're they're hot, they're ready to buy, uh, you can set that goal up so that, that it's dynamic to when they're interested. Uh, obviously, then the last two, adjust a contact score and adjust a deal score. You know, maybe you want to score that all contacts live by, that is that base contact record, like engagement. And maybe for a deal score, you want something specifically about how ready they are to buy on this deal that you're tracking at this moment in time. So we allow both of those. All right. Perfect. So going into a, a little more detail about both of these processes, um, can, can you tell us, you know, just a, a little bit more? Yeah, for sure. So as we have here, lead scoring, both contact and deal allows you to assign points or take them away from a total score based on actions your contact takes. Uh, you can then use this, as I've said, when someone reaches a score threshold or range to fire off actions within an automation or entire automation recipes. Uh, event tracking is building, uh, tracking around a specific event occurring, usually in a, uh, an action a contact takes, maybe something like uh, logging into your membership portal for the first time, um, or perhaps uh, finishing a very specific quiz, you know, that you have set up. You can also fire off those actions when those events are met as well. Both allow for building an automated system that does the three R's, as I like to say, which is route, reward, and reach out to context based on the logic that you've set up. Awesome. Yes. So one of the things that we hear a lot um, is that, you know, 
the big players in the space, the the companies that have, you know, unlim- seemingly unlimited resources and manpower and ability to gather all this data and take it in and use it to give you exactly what you want. It's just simply unattainable for some of the smaller players. But uh, systems like lead scoring and event tracking really allow you to, to take that, you know, we've called the pile of data, right? The pages, mm-hmm. the information from integrations, the links they've clicked, the emails they've opened, all that information that you have access to. This is really how you're going to gather it and then decide what to do with it. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I would say that it lets you really drive those things. It's a pile driver, if you will, Ernie. Cody, I I wish I had something. That was incredible. Um, I will just have to go to the next slide. <laughs> um, as far as automation recipes go. So again, you know, this is sort of one step removed from a, a specific automation point, but it looks like we've got a, a few here. Is that right? Yeah. We wanted to talk about automation recipes still during this time because, you know, you're used to this section covering a specific recipe. And this is true that we have so many varieties and so many different systems set up. This is just a screenshot of one page of our marketplace, and it's not even the whole page. Uh, We have a variety of recipes for setting up a scoring system or tracking an event and taking actions when those are met. Uh, We have a link here to our marketplace, too, for ideas on how to use these systems for your business. Yeah, and you can see here just just by the thumbnail images on these recipes, you know, it's it's not just within active campaign. It's it's using actions taken across all the different platforms, whether that's, you know, SMS or it looks like there's a Shopify or e-commerce example here, there's Bonjoro, there's Google Contacts, you know, it really is going to depend on the actions that you you decide to track the points that you want to give them, and then, you know, what you want to happen after that. So uh, definitely an all encompassing sort of process that's going to help you automate that that entire customer journey. Yeah. So what else do uh, these processes let you do? I was about to say, Ernie, you did a perfect segue because this is going to, we're talking about what this lets you do now. So the first and most important thing, run your business while you sleep by providing truly personalized experiences for your customer. You've set it up. And just because you're not at the computer at the time they're taking these actions, it's still the journey you want to provide them, which is so important. Right. Now, let's say you're taking a little bit more of a direct approach and you're looking at a contact too. These things, knowing the scores for various things, knowing if events have happened or not, this lets you know when you look at a contact where they are in their journey with you at just a glance. Mm. And then of course, this last one I really love, which is guide contacts to desired actions, incentivize them to take said actions. And I wanna point out, we don't necessarily mean like a monetary reward, like a discount or something. You definitely can do that too. It's more that you've built the pathway so it will be natural for contacts to go down the pathways you've laid out for them. Um, especially with, is the score this, then do this. If is the score not there yet, then we're going to send them down this path. And of course, send them down this path where they're not quite there, retarget them as needed to get them back on that pathway you want for them. Yes, absolutely. And you know, th- these first two points are so incredibly critical to, you know, once businesses get to a certain point, they're just not, a, they're not able to provide that level of care and attention and time for all of their customers. There's just not enough time in the day. And that's a good problem to have because it means you have a lot of customers, but these processes allow you to get more done with less. And then also, you know, being able to see exactly where someone is. I mean, that is, that is customer experience automation. That's, that's the goal, right? Exactly. All right. Um, so if we if we have some people watching that want to set up um, lead scoring and event tracking or, or add some automations that have to do with that, what should they set up before? So the very first things that you need to set up, you need to set up your scoring rules and your event tracking, which in the next couple of slides, we'll look at where those live in the platform. We're going to show you where those are. But you want to set those up because it will ask you when you're setting up an automation or using a recipe, which score you want to use or what event you want tracked. So that's a that's a mise en place, if you will. You have to have that beforehand. And then, of course, you want to break down, and this is, you know, the paper before process that I know you love so much, Ernie. Break down what rules and events belong to what process. Sure, you could have one large system that accommodates it all, but that's going to be a little bit trickier to fire specific actions off of. It's easier to run a number of specific smaller processes. Think like maybe an engagement process for when you feel like someone's starting to drift away. And, you know, a deal... Uh, like heat map, how interested are they in buying? Both of them might use the rules of opens an email, but the end result's gonna be so different. So, you know, you know my Christmas tree metaphor. It's so much easier if you have a lot of little processes, you can see if something goes wrong, where it went wrong and fix it, than if everything goes out at once, you know. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and having those individual processes down, one is going to help you when you go in to set this up, but it's also going to help you just understand and identify your process by looking at it as a bunch of individual pieces rather than just this big thing. Um, some, some very helpful perspective there. So getting into the platform here, if we're looking up to, or looking to set up lead scoring, where, where do we go? Yes. So you're going to go to the contact section and then the sub uh, directory of manage scoring. As mm -hmm. you can see in the top right, you can add a score. Um, what that's going to do, you can choose the type. If it's a contact score, if it's a deal score, you can set them to be active or inactive. Let's say you ran a campaign, you're running a score on, and then you sunset it. You can just set that inactive from here, uh, and it won't get those it won't get those points added or deducted anymore. But yeah, that's where you go to set up scoring in your uh, in your active campaign account. And is there a limit as to how many different rules we can set up here? Um, so one of the things we want to point out too, there isn't, this is more where you create the actual uh, scores and you can create rules to, for things that occur. But if you want to automate them, you create the scores here and then you'll go build out those pathways in automations, but there ah, is no limit. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So moving on then to event tracking, where, where yes. does this live? Event tracking, you can go uh, to your settings or you can go uh, to your pages uh, directory. Either one will work. And then you'll choose tracking um, and it will take you the top part of the page is site tracking. So you do have to scroll down just a little bit and then you'll be on event tracking. And event tracking is where you set up, uh, you know, using coding, what events you want tracked and you kind of start putting out and listening. Uh, and then once you add that event in, you can start tracking it there. But this is where you go to in the platform to set that up. And same as before, how many events can we can we put in here? As as many as your heart desires, Ernie. Okay, and it looks like you can manage those on the right side just with that X. If you just cross that off, that event won't be tracked anymore. Correct. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, Cody, I mean, these two processes are extremely valuable in terms of you know figuring out who the right person is, what the right message is, what the right time is, and what the right medium is, um, which is, you know, CXA in a nutshell. So thank you very much, my friend. I, uh, I, as always, appreciate your time. Of course. Thanks for having me, Ernie. All right. Well, that is our show for this week. Thank you so much for your time today. I really hope that you feel like you learned something new about customer experience automation, or even just how to think about these concepts um, you know, and apply them to your business. If you are interested in exploring lead scoring, event tracking, any of the things that we have talked about today, uh, go ahead and start an active campaign trial. If you're already a customer, get in touch with one of your reps and uh, see how you can start incorporating these things into your business today. Um, I wanted to also thank Dr. Megan and Sudeep who sent in the questions that Shiv and I answered. Uh, I also want to thank Shiv for stopping by for his wonderful help today in presenting, co-hosting, and folding my laundry. Um, if you are interested in learning more about customer experience automation from Shiv, you can check out the Active Campaign Digital Study Hall series that Shiv co-hosts with his teammate Mo, um, and they do a thorough deep dive into the concept. And exclusive to Growth Decoded viewers, a 75% discount on Digital Study Hall. Use code GROWTH DECODED, all caps, one word. You can see it here in this, uh, in this thumbnail image. Redeem this discount. You're not going to find it anywhere else. Uh, join us next time, Wednesday, May 12th, as we investigate the concept of marketing automation. Until then, good luck finding the right person, sending the right message at the right time, on the right medium. Do your laundry, and uh, we'll see you next time with a marginally larger plant. Thanks, everybody.